China is about to build the world's largest nuclear-powered cargo ship to propel 24,000 containers. But this time, they aren't using conventional uranium reactors. They're instead using a state-of-the-art molten salt reactor. And for the fuel, they're using thorium, an abundant, cost-effective resource in China. This departure from traditional nuclear design means that China is branching out and might not just be the leaders in cars and technology, but could soon be world champions in nuclear energy as well. While the Western public debates the merits of nuclear, Chinese state companies are currently constructing 21 new reactors. By comparison, the UK is only building two, while America only has one under construction. Though the Vogel plant in Georgia will eventually generate one gigawatt of electricity, enough to power a mid-sized city, it's a drop in the ocean compared to China's aggressive expansion. The only country that is remotely close to China's dedication to nuclear is India, and they only have eight reactors planned. By the end of the decade, China is expected to operate the largest nuclear fleet in the world. Without question, China is well and truly on their way to reshaping global energy forever. But the question on everyone's lips is whether China will export its technology, or will it focus solely on its domestic projects? If China keeps its cards close to its chest, it may be a lifetime before another country overtakes the Asian giant. Then again, if a radical new technology helps a Western country leapfrog China, then Beijing may regret not sharing its knowledge sooner. So, let's answer a few basic questions. First, what does this mean for the nuclear industry? What does this mean for international politics? And what does it mean for the future of Western nuclear power? Investigating how China got ahead, understanding the scientific advancement behind the acceleration, and studying the responses to gauge how other countries intend to compete can help us understand China's position. Once we do that, we can put China on the first ever version of the Atomic Blender nuclear energy leaderboard. Starting at the beginning. For decades, nuclear power has been a chessboard where the West has dominated the checkered squares. With a current fleet of 93 reactors outputting more than 95 gigawatts, more electricity than any other country, according to the International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, it's easy to understand how the US and its allies maintained dominance for so long. And that fleet's not going anywhere anytime soon. In fact, US licenses grant plants operations for 40 years, and up to 80 or more with extensions. This means that even if America refused to create any new stations, it would still be a strong contender on the nuclear platform. And that's still the case, even though dominance started to fall in the mid-80s. It's during this time that China went from pawn to king in the blink of an eye. That's all down to China focusing on their domestic market, leaving the international competition to others like Russia. That's because they had practical reasons to look inward. As China's economy and population grew, so did its demand for energy. So when the Chinese were building cities and infrastructure, they used the opportunity to implement new initiatives for nuclear reactors. There was also another factor to kickstart China's nuclear takeover, coal. After all, the bedrock of fossil fuels has been the perfect energy source since the Victorian era, and it still accounts for two-thirds of China's electricity. That's why, despite the effectiveness of nuclear energy, its output still contributes to only 5% of the country's electricity. And with the rise in private car ownership, Cities have become covered in dense layers of smog. But all that dirty air is wrecking havoc on the nation's general health. The West doesn't have the same imperatives, given our air is, at least by comparison, much cleaner. You could say that China's need for nuclear is greater. Their foray into nuclear was aided by purchasing of technology from France, Russia, and yes, even the US. And what couldn't be bought was built with state support. Everything, from the supply chain to the financing of the nuclear sector, is backed by the Chinese government. Given how China runs things, it's not hard to understand how quickly paperwork can be pushed through administrative processes. Projects aren't dragged through lengthy public reviews or comment periods like in the US, and the tighter government control delivers a more, shall we say, streamlined chain of command. The counterargument in favor of the Western approach is that as sluggish as the process may be, it's vital for strength testing ideas, especially where health and safety are concerned. Yet China's record for safety is much better than detractors are willing to grant, at least where nuclear reactors are concerned. In fact, China's commitments to safety have a long public record. For starters, there are repeated inspections from independent international bodies, including the IAEA. These groups are in little doubt about China's dedication to nuclear culture. This highlights the disparity between how the West perceives China's global standing and its own. It's also a good sign that China hasn't experienced any major accidents, despite having operated since the 1960s. Any incidents that have occurred were localized entirely within the plants themselves, without any effect to the surroundings. 
No energy technology is perfect, yet China's few hiccups show that they are clearly doing something right. Compare that with the rest of the world. All of you watching right now are fully aware of how Chernobyl casts a long shadow of doubt over nuclear energy. In Japan, Fukushima remains contentious, while in the US, Pennsylvania's Three Mile Island accident can easily be cited as the reason to halt America's reactor production. Even disaster-free projects aren't helping nuclear's image in the West. The delays at the Vogel plant in Georgia are now infamous. Plus, it blew through early budget estimates, costing more than double the original price tag. And given how the US and Europe only started rebuilding plants 10 to 15 years ago, it suggests their interest in closing the gap with China is like closing the stable door after the horse has already bolted. Or is it? Perhaps America still has a shot at reclaiming dominance. Nuclear scientists are always working hard at technological breakthroughs, so perhaps the billions of American dollars that have been invested in this ketchup will pay off in the end. Consider how smaller reactors aren't nearly as costly, plus their modular designs mean that they can be built in factories and then assembled on sites. This nimbleness could make starting and finishing projects faster. Some are scaled-down versions of light water reactors, which have become the go-to design for conventional plants. Alternatively, there are advanced reactor designs, like the TerraPower Natrium Reactor or the X-Energy High Temperature Gas Cooled Reactor, which is claimed to be the safest, most economic design for small nuclear reactors. Combining these factors means the West has a few options to explore, but whether or not it's enough depends on China's current projects. And here we need to take a closer look to see if China's bitten off more than they can chew. Most of China's plants are using Western technology, or basing ideas on Western designs. The simple reason is that the West is more advanced, but another factor is China's unwillingness to innovate their own designs. The CPR-1000 is a Generation 2 Plus pressurized water reactor, a somewhat outdated design inspired by France's own 900 megawatt class from the early 1970s. Then there's the CAP-1000. This is essentially a direct copy of the modern Westinghouse AP-1000 and was approved for construction by China's State Council on 31st July 2023. Defenders will say that China is putting their own spin on classic designs in order to build more rapidly. But critics will point to their reputation of stealing ideas as proof that the country's lead will remain dependent on foreign help. But maybe these are just a few bad apples spoiling the bunch. After all, the container ship I mentioned at the start is undeniably radical. And should the project complete without a hitch, then it will drastically improve the nation's standing both on the nuclear stage, but also in importing and exporting. And here is where we can see facets of China's long-term nuclear plan and political strategy. As much as power plants are needed to address the nation's internal problems, bootstrapping them to the biggest industries suggests that China is keen to forge long-term relationships. China has signed contracts to build at least eight reactors around the world, with ambitions for at least a dozen more. We've already seen how Russia plays politics with power plants. In the 90s, when Russia was getting back onto its feet in the aftermath of the Soviet Union, business ventures were a way to create new allegiances. Selling nuclear reactors helped make Russia a powerful force, while Europe's reliance on Russian gas demonstrates how relationships forged on energy last many lifetimes. Even Turkey, a member of NATO, signed up to a 60-year agreement with Russia to get plants built, operated, and fueled. It's no wonder Russia has remained the world's largest exporter of nuclear reactors. This arrangement creates a long-term dependency, which is often more than just about energy. No doubt China is aware of the power of, well, nuclear power. So even though Western technology is still here, it seems China is prepared to use nuclear diplomacy to try and edge out the US for good. After all, we drive Chinese cars, use Chinese gadgets, and manufacture our goods in Chinese factories. Is it so hard to believe our energy could soon be Chinese as well? Now let's see how China, an upcoming nuclear power, fares on the first ever ranking of the Atomic Blender Nuclear Energy Leaderboard. Starting with size, China currently produces nearly 400 terawatt hours of electricity annually from nuclear energy, which is more than almost every other country, only coming in second to the United States. On a scale of 1 to 10, it gets a clear 9 out of 10. However, that large amount of energy is spread relatively thin over China's massive industrial and population base, accounting for just 5% of total electrical output, well below average for other nuclear countries. So it gets a 3 out of 10. China has a long history of operating nuclear power, and its plants have some of the best capacity factors in the world, beating out countries like the United States and France. However, most of this experience has only come within the past two decades, so for operating experience, it gets an 8 out of 10. Infrastructure 
What more is there to say, really? China has an extensive supply chain for everything needed to support nuclear plants, from heavy forging of reactors, skilled personnel, research labs, and, as we've seen, can build new plants with little difficulty. Really, the only thing it lacks is sufficient access to domestic uranium mines, instead having to import from places like Kazakhstan. Still, it gets an easy 9 out of 10. Finally, growth. China has seen more growth in nuclear output in absolute terms than any other country, generating nearly five times as much as it did compared to 10 years ago. And strong government support and policies look to continue that trend into the future. That substantial growth, though, is still essentially only keeping up with increasing demand, rather than doing any serious expansion. So, it gets a 9 out of 10. Overall, that gives China, the inaugural country on the Atomic Blender Nuclear Energy Leaderboard, a 7.6, a score that will be tough to beat. And if you'd like a deep dive into how China's top competitor, Russia, controls its market, you should watch this video. A special thanks to Economics Explained for inspiring the leaderboard format. You should check them out if you like insightful videos on economic analysis. And thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next one.